What's up, everybody? I want to give you an update on what we think the market, the economy might do over the next 12 months. Got some great charts. You got to stick around. I'm going to try and zip through these quick because I know your time is valuable. At least give you a little bit peek under the hood, what our research group is talking about. I even have some slides in here from Carson Wealth Management Group. And you'll see those as well. They're an independent firm out there on the research side uh, also. So let's get into this real quick. On the economy up front, inflation has come in recently down underneath the 5% range and that 4% range. We're predicting by year end inflation to come in around the 3.8% mark right there. On that, we think the U.S. GDP growth right around 1.2%. That's the gross domestic product, all the products and goods and services produced out there. Unemployment rate in December to remain around 3.7%. So trends looking good. That I mean, the GDP a little bit low. Typically, you want to see in a growing economy about 3%. The other thing is multifamily units are on the rise. So this is a good thing in theory for rents, which is a big impact on the CPI. Consumer price index, which had been so high, reached up around that 9% range. Now we're back down, like I talked about, around that 4% range. But as, as these rents potentially come down with more multifamily units being built out there, that's big apartment complexes, stuff like that, single family homes, that hopefully will bring down the pressure on pricing in that category, which would be obviously great for renters. Spending prior to the pandemic, here's this shows you. Consumers returning to pre-pandemic share of the goods and services out there. Used to be a lot of services, and then it switched to goods as people didn't really need the services like hotels and going out all the time and spending just discretionary stuff on that. But that is now shifting. As you can see, the far right, we're getting back up to where it's more service-oriented being spent, which is a good thing. And that is creeping up to where we were pre-pandemic. So that's another thing. Inflation, which I mentioned before, but this shows you kind of all the categories in here. From the peak up here at 9.1% June of 2022, and now it's all the way down to about 4% everything in here. And these are all broken out by different categories. You can take a screenshot of this and look at it later. But food starting to come down. Medical care slowed down as well. New and used autos right here, that is definitely coming back down as well. And then housing, starting to see that little drop that we talked about earlier on the other screen, then maybe that will be, that's the big part of it. You can see that that's a huge piece of the inflation. If that comes down, that's going to help out a lot. And then we go into labor market. So we have seen, this is the best labor market that we've seen since the 90s. So we're getting back up here as far as employment to population ratio from 25 to 54 years of age, we are right up in here where we're back in the 1990s, the record being up in here, over 81% employment minus the population ratio in there. So that is still a good sign for the economy there. And then debt service. So there's a lot of talk out there. Oh, people are in these massive amounts of debt and everything. But according to the numbers that we're seeing and that are tracked, this is from Carson Investment Research from the Federal Reserve. And by the way, this previous chart also from Carson, as well as this one, Carson Wealth Management Group, just so you know that, where I'm getting that data from. But anyway, debt service ratio, percentage of disposable income, uh, it's been creeping up here a little bit, coming out of the pandemic, been spending more, which is, that's a good thing from an economy standpoint, but we are nowhere near a uh, percentage of debt service compared to income. We're at 13% during the 08, 09 crisis, the banking crisis, mortgage, when people were getting, getting stated income loans where they didn't have to prove them and all this stuff. We're still well down here. That, that'd have to be like a 40% increase on there. So that still looks pretty good. Disposable income gains outpacing inflation pretty dramatically here year to date, 10.8% compared to inflation at 5.5 at the time this was done. This is also Carson back in end of May for one year, 7.9 compared to 5.4. So that also hitting in the right direction. 
And then consumer spending, real personal consumption. This still looks really good here. This is not any issues as well. And then here's the other one is your, oh, everybody's got this massive credit card debt out there. So this is the credit utilization ratio, which is the percentage of available credit and people's credit cards. And it used to be back in 03 early, again, right here's the 08, 09, you can see. So this might be a trend to watch going forward. This ever starts creeping back up over 50%, you know, there could be a massive credit crisis com coming from that standpoint. But we're still way down here. It's been trending down at 38%. The pre-pandemic average, let's see, pre-pandemic average is 51%. Now at 38 on there. So, and then the home equity, another one to look at, 22%. Uh, compared to pre-pandemic of 24, and it used to be up uh, in the little high 20. So that's also looks healthy um, out there. And then also delinquencies. If the pink is severely derogatory delinquent. 120 plus days is the orange. 90 is the yellow. 60 days is the dark blue slash black. And then 30 days, the light lime green. All again, been, ever since the crisis, trending downward big time, as you can see this right here. So any issues that we're seeing there, either new home builds and building permits starting to tick back up over here on the right, 2023, that's coming back up in there as well. Manufacturing construction surged last summer and also real manufacturing construction and computer electronics also doing good. And all these past slides are from Carson. All right, so that's just the general consumer, the economy, what's going on. If, if you're looking at it like, wow, this looks pretty, looks pretty strong, let's look at the equity markets, kind of what we're seeing there and what's going on. So what we call supportive stock market indicators that have been out there. So, and a lot of these have been pretty much hit, which we've, I showed these charts a while back, even before this year started, what typically happens in this third presidential cycle year and especially if you get a midterm year where it's down dramatically after the midterm elections popping back up on average 15.2%, per, 15 84% 15 of the time positive. Well, that's what's happened where we've outperformed this right now so far this year coming up. Midterm election, we talked about that, 16.8 annual, 89% positive. We've hit that as well. A new bull market, 18.9%. Uh, S&P officially entered the bull. Usually a year later, it's up on average about 17%. Basically what this does, it's, it shows the start of a bear market going all the way back to 1956, which is a, and then we get a drop of 20% plus end of the bear market when it happened. And this is the bear market return. You can see every one of these is down below 20%. Some big ones. Uh, the one we had was 25.4% recently. We had that one during COVID at 33.9. And then up 20% from bear market lows. When did that happen? Well, it just happened here in June 8, 2023. It took 164 days from the starting point, which was back here, excuse me, January 2, or from the bottom, uh, 10, 12, 22. So it took that 164 days to recover. The average is usually 64, median being about 41, so well above average. So what happens after that? If we come scrolling across, this is the return of the S&P 500 after that point. Well, the market shows up on average 17.7% 12 months from now, 10% at six months. And I'm not going to go over the others. I think the significant ones, because you're investing in equities, we believe you got to have a longer term horizon, not this short period. But just to give you an indication, 17.7% could indicate we have some more run up in the market. I think we're up probably about five or 6% since that bear we got out of the bear. So, you know, another 10% on average, but we've seen some bigger jumps like a 34, a 42 and a 50. Will we get that? We don't, nobody knows for sure. So you see all that positive, right? Well then, well, let's take a look at some other areas. So let's look at bonds. So if we look on a risk return ratio right now, based on what we're seeing, 
This is a great chart put out by LPO Financial say, saying that stocks no longer appear attractive relative to bonds. And you look at these long-term average of the equity risk premium is the S&P 500 earnings yield minus the 10-year treasury yield. So as that 10-year treasury yield goes up, gets a Above here on this top side, it says stocks are cheaper than bonds, but you can see it's been trending down because yields have been going up on the treasuries as the Federal Reserve raised rates. And then the earnings yields of stocks have been coming down as prices go up. Those yields on dividends start coming back down. So it's squeezing that. And then if you get below this mark, it shows typically when stocks are considered more expensive than bonds. So we're kind of on that neutral phase right now. But yields look like they're kind of capping out right now. So maybe they, maybe one more rate increase from what we're seeing. And then after that, maybe we get some rate decreases coming up. Yields across fixed income sectors are above long-term averages. You can see all this in here. I'm not going to go over every single thing, but just bottom line is these particular average yields are right in here. Right now, this is where we sit. This is the range of yields if you go from top the bottom down here, top on this, and all the different kind of bond sectors that are in there. And once the Fed is done raising rates, typically what happens is you see yields start to eventually drop back down on treasuries. So core bonds tend to do well during Fed pauses. So once the Fed stops raising rates, we look at the one-year number, and this has got some three years and Another six months on here. I kind of like the one and three years. So if you look at 1984, which is behind me here, and a one-year period after the Fed paused, the U.S. aggregate bond index went up 24%. And then in 1987, it was 8%, 13 and 87, or excuse me, August, and they, there was another pausing scenario, 17%. Not bad and a lot less risk historically than stock. Up 17%, May 14% of 2000, June of 06, up six and 18 after the Fed pause. They were in a rate increasing period there, up nine. So the average increase about 13% after one year after the Fed pauses, which means, hey, do we want to consider, depending on your situation, I don't know your situation out there. If you want to call us, we can talk about this. And for our clients, we'll be talking to them too here, is might we in the first time in probably, wow, 15 years, talk about buying bonds? Is that kind of crazy or what? On the intermediate long-term phase or long-term maturity end. Because we do get these rate caps and then they start coming down. This is the kind of yields or returns you could get on your investment with both interest that are paid out plus the price appreciation of bonds. So that's what we want to look at. Commodities and currencies. I think this is just kind of basically stating the foreign exchange turnover by currency. You still have the U.S. dollar dominating in here. So when people are talking, oh, the dollar is going away, that's going to have to take some serious mechanisms to do that because if they want to trade with us here in the United States, they got to convert to dollars and buy our stuff in dollars. And then when we buy their stuff, you know, they got to convert currency as well. So a very interesting thing when you hear about the dollar, you know, going away, I would have to myself, I don't see that happening right now. Alternative investments. So we talked about, oh, maybe the market could go up. There's some indications of a strong economy. Oh, maybe their kind of equity valuations are a little high compared to bonds. Well, besides just the bond investments or stocks, what could you do to hedge if maybe stocks go down? Can you make some money potentially? Or if they keep going up, how you can do it? So this talks about hedge funds and categories that produce positive alpha or return above indexes like the S&P, even when the markets are very volatile. And there's different type of hedging strategies out there. And we use some type of hedging strategies that pursue growth on the upside, but also pursue downside protection and the ability to pursue gains on the downside if markets are swinging one way or another out there. Basically, this chart is showing historically, going back to 1957 on this, 
that 72% were positive out of the 47 years, 72%, 28% were negative returns on this bucket over here. But if you look from zero to 20%, this is where the majority of the negative things happen. And most of that zero to 15%, you can see there's only one of these was negative 17.73%. And this was a chart produced by Allianz. So what does that mean? Well, then you've got, historically speaking, the market, as I blow this up, going all the way back to 1980, the average pullback entry year in the stock market, about 14%. And the average historical upside is around that, anyway, depending on the index, you're looking at 7 to 10%. So my idea here is that, all right, if we could be hitting somewhat of a peak, but maybe we still get some more upside of the market, the valuation is a little stretched, but if we get one of these pullbacks of 14% historically entry year during a year period, what if you had an investment strategy where you could pursue growth on the upside, maybe up to that 11, 10% range historically like the market's done, but then also pursue returns if the market goes down up to a certain percent, say around that 14, 15% and give you the potential possibility of making money both ways. No guarantees again here, but those are the type of strategies that we're implementing in our client portfolios, whether they're good for you or not. I have no idea. I don't know your situation personally, but again, call us and be glad to go through that. If you need to get a hold of us, here it is. Contact us 513-641-6307. You can text us at 513-657-0989. Email us right here. William, take a screenshot of that. William.wilkins at lpl.com. Or you can go to our website, pursuefinancialfreedom.com. Click on comprehensive plan and you can actually put in your data. It'll take you to a, a portal, private secure portal. You put your data in, we'll get a hold of you and we can walk you through, have an interview and see if we can strive to make your situation a little bit better. We appreciate it. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Two. With the damn soul, with the damn Here's all our disclaimers out here. Uh, disclosures, I should say. More disclosures. Our definitions of everything in there. And this came from the LPL mid-year 2023 outlook on that.